glad to be here. I'm going to talk about just a very small thing, which is what it means to be humans here on this planet at, at this time in history, which is not an easy time. Uh, huge global disparities of wealth that people really globally have begun to challenge. Huge environmental crises, many of which, like climate change, most of us 20 years ago, unless we were scientists, didn't even know existed. And it's really easy, I think, when we look at these large, hard issues to just feel completely overwhelmed and voiceless and powerless. And so the question I always ask is, how do we reverse that? How do we create what Nelson Mandela calls the multiplication of courage so that one person's voice inspires another, inspires another? And how do we do that on the hardest issues that we can possibly face? Because they're often the most essential ones. There's a sort of trap that I think people get into where they erect, I call it the perfect standard. And they decide that since they need to be able to take a stand, they have to first know every fact, every 17th decimal point statistic, be able to have the answer to every question and be as eloquent as King and saintly as Gandhi and on and on in some impossible level that none of us will ever reach. You need to set that aside. In fact, if you look at the greats of history, none of them have arrived through that process. I, I love the story that Arun Gandhi Grandi's grandson tells about his grandfather. And basically, his family mortgaged everything to send Gandhi to law school, land, jewelry, anything of value. And he gets through. And he gets up in court. Finally, he's a lawyer. And he stammers and stammers. And he cannot get out a single sentence. And he loses. And a few weeks later, same thing happens. And a few weeks later, the same thing happens. And at this point, they're looking at their shining sun and thinking he is going to be a disaster. He is going to be a failure. What have we done? And they don't know what to do. And they finally ship him off to South Africa. And he gains his voice literally and metaphorically in what they call the struggle against apartheid. Now, some people come up to me and say they're very shy. And they're not very confident. I can now say, well, yes, that's true. I know that. But compared to Gandhi, you're the most eloquent person imaginable. And look where he ended up. So I think it's a lesson for all of us. Same thing's true with Rosa Parks. Or le less certainly not shy, but the image we get is somebody who leaps into history, single-handedly invents the civil rights movement, all by herself on a bus in Montgomery. And of course, she does it accidentally. She sort of one day her feet hurt or something like that. And if you look at the real story, none of that's true. Because the key elements that are there for anybody who makes change are there in parts of story. There's the element of community. She's active with the NAACP in Montgomery for 12 years. She's the secretary of the local. And you don't see the network news saying, this is about to make history, folks. Rosa Parks is calling people to come to a meeting. But it's those kinds of humble actions that make history. And so when I look at the community that she was building and part of, there's other people. There's a guy named E. Nixon who was a union organizer who helped get a very, very reluctant Martin Luther King involved. King was just out of divinity school, had all sorts of excuses why somebody older, more experienced, more confident should step forward. Fortunately, Nixon persisted. So that's one lesson, is that when we act, we never act alone. Second lesson, when we act, it's always intentional. It's not accidental. Doesn't mean we know how it's going to turn out. But we, we kind of marry two things. One is the leap of faith. Jim Wallace of the magazine Sojourners puts it well. He says, hope is believing in spite of the evidence and then watching the evidence change. And you look in the people marching in the entire square, and obviously they had to take that leap of faith, given the stakes. Right next to it is intentionality. And that means that you just look strategically and you say, what is it that you're trying to achieve? Who are you trying to bring in? How do you tell your story most powerfully? How do you overcome the obstacles? All those practical questions. In Parks' case, she took trainings at a place called Highlander Center the summer before her arrest. Entire square, they met with people, nonviolent strategists from the US, from the, the Serbian youth movement that overthrew the dictator Milosevic. They knew when they were going in to Tyre Square. They'd already had practice marches. They'd brainstorm on how to respond to the soldiers to neutralize them so they wouldn't get shot. It wasn't accidental, and it never is. Third lesson from Parks is persistence. Imagine if she'd given up in year six, seven, eight, or 10. We'd never have heard of her. So that's part of the story, too. You've got to keep on. And it was a dozen years from that first NAACP meeting to that stand on the bus. Now, when we're acting, one of the things that always gives me courage and heart 
is that we don't know when we draw new people in where they're going to end up. You look at Parks, you ask, how'd she get involved? Her husband co-founded the Montgomery NAACP. That was how she got involved. But who got him involved? He was a barber, a guy named Raymond Parks. And you have to remember that there's somehow these conversations with people we never know their names. They got Raymond Parks involved. He got Rosa Parks involved. A dozen years later comes a stand on a bus that everybody globally has heard about. So when I look at that, I think, I don't know who is out there at any point if we just get them to take that first step where they're going to end up. Vlachov Havel made the same point. He was talking about in the struggle against the communist dictatorships in Eastern Europe. And one day they circulated a petition to free political prisoners. And looking back, he realized it hadn't freed the prisoners, but it had allowed all these people to take their first step to stand up, and they never stopped from there. And a dozen years later, they ended up overthrowing the dictatorship without a shot being fired. They called it the Velvet Revolution. So again, you just don't know on any of these issues when you're getting people involved. The next lesson, I think, is that we're going to have unexpected allies. And this is critical on the most difficult issues. One of my heroes is a guy named Rich Sizek, who was the vice president for governmental affairs of the National Association for Evangelicals. It's an immensely conservative group. He was lobbying on abortion and gay marriage on the side opposite from the one that I'm on. And then one day, he heard a prominent British climate scientist named Sir James Houghton, who also was a British evangelical leader. And Houghton was talking about climate change. And it was, it was a revelation to, to Sizek. He'd never thought about it. The phrase he used is he said, it shook my theology to the core, which I think is a great phrase. Because if you think about something like climate change, I would argue that it should shake all of our theology to the core, our sense of our relationship to the larger whole. It is that consequential, and it is that profound in the stakes. And so Sizek thought, well, what can I do? And he went back to the US and started working in the evangelical community. And what he did, for instance, is he took Harvard climate scientists, and he took them to the Arctic, together with key evangelical leaders like Rick Warren, who did that mega-selling book, The Purpose Driven Life. And when you go to the Arctic, if you've been to the Canadian Arctic, or if you've been to the north, of, north parts of Alaska, you see the melting permafrost. You see where the glaciers have receded. You see where the ice flows, if you go far enough north, are big, are, have opened up. And so it's very visible, and it's very tangible. And they came back, and many of them started speaking out as well. And that matters because, again, we are dealing with the most profound stakes, I would argue, that we've dealt with as a human species. And if you listen to the climate scientists, and it doesn't matter if you're talking about the Canadian Academy of Science, US, British, German, Japanese, Brazilian, they're all coming to the same absolute conclusion, which is this is real, this is urgent, we had better deal with it seriously. The only dissenters are a handful of deniers, and they're all funded by the oil companies, mostly Exxon, the coal companies, the Koch brothers. And interestingly enough, the same group got their, cut their teeth kind of arguing that tobacco didn't really cause lung cancer, funded by the cigarette companies, using the same PR firms, using the same arguments. And if it comes to a choice between Exxon and the climate scientists, I know who I'm going to end up believing. So what's happening? We look around, and we see a world of pretty rapidly marching disasters. Uh, I, I just This last year where I've been, I went to Vermont. Hurricanes don't go there, except Hurricane Irene did. I went to Texas, millions of acres of wildfires out of control. I went to Alabama, there's tornadoes, off the charts level of tornadoes. It looked like a giant lawnmower, just devastated half mile next to the campus where I spoke. Here in the Pacific Northwest, there's pine beetles used to be killed during the winter, but now there's 40 million acres in British Columbia where the trees are dying. It's a bright red color, and then they turn white, and then they die because they weren't killed off by the winter cold. As I'm speaking, much of Thailand is underwater. A fifth of Pakistan last year. People had to evacuate Moscow because of the fires, on and on and on. I mean, I could, I could spend hours talking about it. So the question is, why aren't we dealing with it more? I mean, yeah, it's pretty consequential. I think the problem is we have a kind of human inertia, and the everyday takes over. So if you're co mining coal in China, or you're mining coal in Kentucky, or you're drilling for oil in Alaska or Nigeria, or you're dealing with the tar sands here in Alberta, the day-to-day -day takes over. 
and it blanks out the larger consequences. Or if you're just driving on the highway or flying in a plane or whatever it is. So I remember I spent my very first book, I was on the largest nuclear complex in the world. And they made the plutonium for the first ever atomic bomb. And they made the plutonium for the Nagasaki bomb, and at that point, half the US arsenals. And it was a time when, during the Cold War when there were missiles six, months, six minutes away on the US and Soviet side. So one mishap, and we couldn't, we, the world could have been annihilated. And in fact, there was a Russian major, Soviet major in, a, in an air defense command facility who saw a massive US attack in, on his screen and decided to wait it out. Thank God we might not be here otherwise. And when I went to this community, where people should, you know, they're making the raw materials, they were very nonchalant. Oh, well, you know, I could have been making light bulbs. I'm just making machines work. It's no big deal. And when I asked about dissent, it doesn't matter if I went to the churches or the schools or the bridge clubs or the bars, wherever it was, there was silence. I mean, people were just too afraid to speak out. You know, or they would say, well, you know, I don't really like it, but somebody's going to do it no matter what. I mean, I might as well work here. And I came away with the conclusion that nothing inherently stopped us, except potential for human courage, from annihilating ourselves as a species, because we were that close to the edge. So I come to a place like this, and I think about something like the tar sands, where the same climate scientists that are blowing the whistle say, it is the dirtiest fuel on Earth, partly because there is such a massive quantity of it, and partly because the extractive process and the impact on the boreal forests and the impact on the peatlands means it is as much as three times as dirty as conventional oil. But you know, it's lucrative. I mean, every good cause probably in Alberta and to some extent against Calvary, along uh, and to some extent across the country of Canada, you know, benefits in some ways. It's very hard to question, and I recognize that. And you guys didn't ask to be blessed with this you know, in your backyard. I mean, nobody does. It just happens. So the challenge to me is how do you speak out in a place where maybe it's harder, but maybe people listen to you heed you more because they know it's harder, because they, they know that it's more of a cost. And I think that that's the fundamental challenge. I mean, we all have our challenges on these issues, and we all have to speak out. But I think the challenge here is to say, we're going to have to ask those hard questions in every possible way, because we're closest at hand. We're not as close as Fort Mac or Edmonton, but we're close. And we have to ask them, and we have to ask them publicly and visibly I mean, imagine if Rosa Parks had started an, e -line, an online email petition. I do not think that we would remember her. In contrast with something like the Occupy movement, for all its limitations and flaws, it was people voicing so other human beings could see them and respond. And it may mean that, and it may mean conversations with your neighbors, and it may mean conversations with your coworkers, but I think those conversations have to start. And they have to talk about two things. They have to talk about the realities, the really difficult realities, and what we're doing. And they have to talk about the alternatives. I mean, it's interesting to me to be in Copenhagen, and you land, and there's bicycles everywhere. Old people, seven-year-olds, obese people. I'm talking about the main streets. And they're in these protected lanes. And I think, oh, well, you know, that's just the way it was, because it's a European culture, and they always had bicycles. Except then I see these slides, and in the 70s, it looks like Los Angeles. Cars everywhere, no bicycles at all. And well, what happened? They made a conscious effort to shift to the point the cars are down to barely a quarter of daily commutes, and the rest is public transportations and bicycles. Same way that they worked with wind uh, incentives so that there was a tiny, tiny, the Danish environmental minister at the time said to me, it was two steps above a blacksmith company, this uh, farm equipment company called Vestas that became the biggest wind turbine producer in the entire world and the biggest engine of the Danish economy. And you looked at that and you thought, something is possible here. And they took a pride in it. And the Danish, this is from the Conservative Party, the, the current environmental minister told me about taking US Republican senators out to the melting Greenland ice flows and saying, you're a conservative, I'm a conservative, we ought to be leading in this. That's powerful. So you come back and you think, how do we do that again? Part of it is heeding the scientists. And when James Hansen, probably the leading climate scientist in the world, says, 
If they completely exploit the tar sands resource, it is game over for the planet because you're into cycles like melting Arctic methane beds where we can't reverse it at that point. I take it seriously when he gets 20 of the leading climate scientists to sign a letter to Obama saying stop the Keystone Pipeline because we've got to slow the process down. I take it seriously. And you may say, oh, you know, well, we don't trust Hansen, or we don't trust David Suzuki, or we don't trust the Canadian Global Forest Council. But given the choice between them and Exxon, that's really our choice. Who do you trust? And if you trust the people who have been sounding the warning, then you have to say, maybe what I do could matter. Maybe what I do could shift things. Maybe my voice added to others, added to others, could actually be the pivotal voice. And yeah, it's hard here, but maybe it matters even more here. That's the challenge. Now, let me give you a story about persisting, because you're going to have to persist to make this happen. You know Desmond Tutu. You think of the, him, the Nobel Peace Prize winner from South Africa. Imagine living a life like Tutu's, everything you're up against, being humiliated repeatedly as a black man in South Africa, seeing friends tortured, imprisoned for decades, murdered, sharing the truth and reconciliation where the horrendous stories come out of the crimes of apartheid. And you would think that that would just, you know, that would be enough. He would have stopped. But he was working in Haiti. He was working in Rwanda, speaking against the Iraq war. Recently eight, got eight Nobel Prize win, Peace Prize winners to sign a letter again to Obama on the Keystone Pipeline. He says the climate change, the three billion reasons to do it are the three billion poorest people in the world who did not create it, who will bear the brunt. And if you look at Hutu, instead of being sort of beaten down, he's joyous. He's joking. Every time he speaks, he's joking. But I remember this telling a joke. He said, God has a sense of humor. Who would think the world would learn anything from South Africa? We're not the brightest country. We thought we we're going to make a missile to the sun. And when people pointed out that it would burn up, we said we would do it at night. It would be fine. It would be OK. <laughs> and then I'm sitting there, oh, but wait a moment. He should have been talking about the freedom struggle. And I get it. He's reminding us to laugh. I remember the first time I saw him, he wasn't feeling well, he even lay down for a nap. But when there was a band from East LA and people started dancing, he starts up there dancing like I've never seen a Nobel Peace Prize winner, much less an archbishop, dance before. And I'm thinking this is interesting. And I remember that this is somebody who embraces every gift of the world, even as he fights to save it. And that's our challenge, too. We've got to be joyous. We've got to be persistent. We've got to be strong. And when we do that and we act with enough courage and the courage multiplies enough, we learn why we're here on this planet. Thanks.